Firstly, welcome everyone to our Facebook Live today on um, the truth telling process and the work that's been happening. My name is Marcus Stewart. I'm the co chair of the First People's Assembly, and I'm joined by some of our uh, deadly regional reps to talk through and just have a bit of a yarn with each other around what is the truth telling process, where it's at, and what we might anticipate it could actually achieve. But firstly, as is our custom, I want to acknowledge country. I'm currently on Wurundjeri country, so I want to pay respects to their elders past and present, but also acknowledge that we all meet on Aboriginal lands. Sovereignty was never ceded and this land was stolen and it's important that um, we always recognise that. Firstly, and before we start, we've had a pretty devastating year this year. So I think it's important that we hold a minute silence uh, to recognise our sorry business and we'll start that now. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, so without further ado, um, you know, the mob aren't here to hear from me, they're here to hear from our deadly um, representatives of the assembly. So I'll, I'll pass around for everyone to, uh, to introduce themselves and I'll start with um, co-chair of the Truth Telling Committee, Melissa Jones. I'm off on you. Sorry. Yeah, hello. Um, my name's Melissa Jones. I'm um, from Latchi Latchi Country. Um, I'm a Northwest um, member, um, reserve seat. I currently sit there with Troy um, McDonald, who sits as a co chair with me. And um, yeah, just like to yeah, pass that on to Donna. Over to you, Donna. <laughs> Okay, I'm the oldest of this group, I think. Hi, everyone. Um, everyone knows me. I'm Donna Wright. I'm a Gunditjmara woman, um, Gunditj mob from southwest Victoria. Um, I'm, I'm out here tonight in um, Nilan Gunditj country. So, and we're here to talk about, you know, um, what is truth telling and why is it important. So, you know, this is a really important conversation that we feel as assembly members, we have to have with the community. And, and it's important tonight that everyone um, has a say um, in this truth telling process, what it, what it looks like. And, you know, truth telling, this is long overdue. We've been telling these stories our, for generations and generations. And, um, you know, it's important to have the voices of our people um, be heard about the injustice injustices. So, you know, on a personal level, mum stolen generation. So many of our people, elders, did not um, have an opportunity to um, be part of this process. And um, it's really important tonight that we get the community on board talking about truth telling. And we'll have a bit of a yarn about the different aspects of it. But it's such an important um, important process and it's very much the community needs to inform the process um, and have their say on what truth telling is so you know there's been we we know those stories um, but there's opportunity but there's opportunities where you know we need more and more of our people to be part of this so it's so important um, to have this um, live conversation tonight and uh, with the fellow assembly members. Uh, I think I've just jumped into question one there, Lisa. <laughs> um, but you know, this land, this is stolen land. You know, our sovereignty has never been ceded. Our people um, have 
you know, still suffer injustices today. So we need to have a process that looks at that. What what is it going to be, and um, how how are we going to do this work together with our communities? So yeah, I think it's really important to hear from our people. Nah, points well made, Annie Donna, as always. Um, I'll hand over to Pete to introduce himself, and then I'll move on to uh, to Jason. There we go. Uh, good, uh, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name's Peter Hood. I'm a Kurnai man. Currently, I'm Gunai Kurnai country. Uh, I guess yeah, just to echo uh, Melissa and and Donna's words about the, the truth telling. Um, you know, the, the truth telling forwardness that we're going to be talking about tonight, and you know, and it's going to create a future and it's it's about you know truth telling or truth stories from back from elders my elders and every other aboriginal person in the state of victoria's elders as well that will help shape our futures and um for for my children my grandchildren etc and etc and for everybody else's so um uh look forward to seeing some questions and hopefully we gotta answer some some we won't be able to as I say, I, I come into this this commission. I got into the committee, and I, I you know say that I, I don't know everything, and I may not know everything. But there's some things that oh, it's a learning process for me as well. So, um, thanks, Marcus. Uh, thanks, Pete. And um, I'll hand over to Jace. Jace, if you want to give us a bit of an introduction, but also give us a bit of background of the work you've previously done and how the uh, resolution come about and come to the assembly, if you don't mind. Sure. So for everyone out there in um, digital land, my name's uh, Jason Cully. Um, I'm a muddy, muddy, wamba, wamba man and um, um, committee elected member for the First People's Assembly for the Northwest of Victoria. Um, on the author res resolution um, regarding the truth telling, by no means is it my idea. Um, so I guess, that, but first and foremost, I want to pay my respects and um, acknowledge everyone's work, in, you know, in, in advance and just beforehand um, that led up to this. All the founders of our ACOs, the founders of our 10 embassies, all of our human rights activists, all of those who, 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 who um, you know, really, really were in the struggle right from the beginning. Those who, you know, back to the Stolen Wealth Games where people were protesting in um, Brisbane way back then. All the marches, all the activism up to this that led up led up to this. This is all part of. This is all just part of that. In my, for me, I guess uh, truth telling has always been front and centre um, in every everything that I've, I've in my lifetime that I've you know been born in '72 that I participated in. Every time we've had marches and we've you know we've been marching for truth as long as we've been marching um, for land rights, as long as we've been marching for treaty. Um, so it's not a new it's not a new concept. It's not, you know, it's something that we've actively campaigned for state, at a local level, state level, at a national level. And I go back and think of the first opening of the federal parliament when an old um, Radjuri uncle, Jimmy Clements, on his own, turned up to the parliament there in Canberra and um, made it clear that he was there to assert his rights as a sovereign owner of, of the federation. And then everyone else has come, you know, since then, William Cooper, Jack Patton, the, the, the birth of our ACOs that were born under a human rights agenda, all of this all ties in as part, you know, it was all part of this accumulation of where we are now with, with the truth telling. And for me personally, it was only one day, one day yesterday um, you know, on, you know, the 17th of November in 2017, we brought Mungo Man home on country. And I was one of the speakers out there with my auntie, auntie Tuki and, um, I made it, made it clear out then about at Mungo, um, you know, the importance of the truth telling and the rest of Australia needing to have an understanding of that truth. So then coming back to Victoria and with the government committing to a treaty, I just really felt it was really important that whilst as us as Assembly were responsible for establishing the framework, I really felt it really essential and really important that we had to have the truth telling so that we could have you know, a, a human rights focus. Um, you know, we can have we can have a we can have an inquiry a commission, whatever it's going to be called. 
that are just a human rights focus that had less the evidential facts and findings so that it makes it easier when it comes to the treaty when it comes to the negotiation stages of, of the treaty so but i, I really I, i'm really mindful and really aware of the, of the distrust and, and and the minister herself always talks about a trust deficit we know that better than anyone as aboriginal people um you know that there is a trust def trust deficit so and I wanted, I wanted to just be sure that when I put the resolution up that I, what, you know, none of us are comfortable with having these things assessed under Australian law or Victorian law because Australian and Victorian law can, has and continues to inflict human rights abuses on Aboriginal people. So when I put the resolution up, there were, there were a couple of things in there that I put up was the um, preamble for advancing the treaty process with Aboriginal Victorians Act because it's actually in the legislation uh, mentioning the truth. Is that all something that includes ensure all Victorians are included in it. I wanted to ensure that we had the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples um, as part of the resolution and international best practice in the use of comparable truth and justice inquiries and principles of uh, use in transitional justice-based procedures. Now, this is a new concept really on, on the world stage in the last probably 30 or so years, but going back to the international uh, best practices, when I was really, I, I looked in a lot of things. I know that there's been 40 different countries that have had truth inquiries. Um, Mauritius was one example that had an independent one and they went back 370 years to investigate the impacts of um, slavery and, ec and the economic consequences of it since then. So <clears throat> the good news was that assembly, um, you know, we all got together and we, we passed this resolution and, and you know, and the, I guess, the good thing about that also is the government were really quick to respond. Uh, the minister took it to cabinet and got cabinet approval. And I was, you know, the minister advised that she took the resolution in its raw form. And so cabinet have agreed to the resolution for the points that I just um, spoke out about. And the really was I put the international best practices because when you're looking at, um, I guess, uh, I wanted this to be a public education, a public education um, thing with a focus on victims and survivors first and foremost. And, but, you know, when we look at the, the marches, look at the Black Lives Matter rallies that we've had, we look at the um, Invasion Day marches, the number of Australian youth that are marching with us, we're turning out 50,000, we're turning out 100,000 people. These are, um, you know, non-Aboriginal Australians that are demanding a right to truth. They're demanding a right to truth. They're, de they're marching in solidarity um, with us. So in a way, if the government's going to be committing to a treaty, it's a way we talk about um, free, informed and prior consent. It's an important tool to also give free, informed and prior consent to the rest of Victoria as to why and let, gives them, let them have a clear understanding as to why we have committed to a treaty um, and why the government's committed to a treaty on their behalf. So then for me, it's just like about I see the potential in when we're doing community engagement as running along, running parallel with um, public education, because I think that for us now, it's an opportunity for all of the Victorian Aboriginal people to have an understanding of what is the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, what is um, international law, and also, um, you know, when you look at the International Covenant on the Crimes Against Genocide, there was four elements in that. Um, you know, absolutely 100% ticks all the box. When you're looking at the massacre maps, when you're looking at the um, Royal Commission into deaths in custody, when you're looking at the Bringing Them Home report, <clears throat> it's also an opportunity <clears throat> for the government to now to come out and stipulate, you know, um, under the lens <clears throat> of international law that we have commit that the government has committed genocide in Aboriginal people. And it's also an avenue if you look at on the international law scope, custom international law is where Aboriginal law is recognised on the international level. But it's not so much about uh, prosecutions for um, the stuff, you know, 200 years ago, but it's about putting the government on trial and having a finding of um, genocide. It's about um, that right to know for everyone else. It's a, you know, it needs to be a really important public education campaign uh, running alongside parallel with, um, with, with, with treaty and with the buy, you know, having the rest of Victoria have a clear, crystal clear understanding about what, what, what history has done to us, but how we have the answers for ourselves also. 
in a cultural context, in a cultural context, it's like having the smoking ceremony for us. The truth telling and the findings in the commission is the spear, is the spear that Victoria has to take. So we're spearing Victoria in the leg. But we're also, after we deliver that spear, we're responsible to all heal together. So essentially that's, you know, um, that's pretty much the basis. And, you know, what I said is a critical element of uh, truth telling and, and treaty. Yeah, thanks, Jase. Really strong points, really good context of how we got to June and the resolution and really good opportunity now to hear from, you know, our viewers on Facebook Live, our community about what this potentially could look like. Because we're here to talk about a truth telling process that the assembly is currently working on. We're currently developing this process, but community's input and community ownership is critical. And that's why a lot of the questions we'll be asking um, to our assembly members will be asking you as well. You know, have it, have put some comments in, put some questions in the comments. Tell us what you think, because that's what we're here to do. This is your process and we're keen to get this right. So we need to hear from you. We've also got some questions on our on our website, which we're keen for everyone to jump on, www firstpeoplesvic.org, where we've got a questionnaire, jump on, have some input and tell us what you think, because this is the community's process. This will be a community driven outcome. We're also, um, well, like Aunty Donna pointed out a little earlier, um, you know, what is a truth telling uh, or what is truth telling and why, it's in, why is it important? You know, Aunty Donna, you made some really key points and I'm gonna throw to Melissa now uh, to build on those, Melissa. Um, can you, um, I'll pass that to Donna, is, if that's all right. Sorry, I was just- Yeah, sure, so, Ani, Donna, you made some really strong points. Um, we'll hand the, hand the floor back over to you. Yeah, I, uh, thanks. Thanks, Melissa. But yeah, I, in my introduction, I sort of jumped to the question, but you know, it's, it's such a, we've only got an hour, we just want to cover a little bit of work, but I'm also sit on the truth telling committee with Lisa, Peter, uh, Troy, who's not here tonight, shout out to Troy McDonald, who does an amazing job with Melissa on this committee. And, um, you know, truth telling um, has to be a safe process too. Um, the retelling, the reliving of experiences, but this is something that the community can um, have their say and lead this work. So, you know, I spoke about, you know, my mum's style and generation. So, you know, I found out about that when I was a 30 year old when she was giving her evidence um, at the inquiry um, with Sir William Dean and, and you know, it was such a shock and it was never spoken of. Um, and that's just the way it was for our family and a lot of families and communities. But, um, you know, tonight, this session is about talking to the communities about how, how this process um, should be developed and the community having a say in it. And like Jason touched on, you know, um, all the human rights violations that occurred in the past 230 or so years, um, we've documented and, and we've held those Royal Commissions and those inquiries and, um, you know, there's information there, but um, this is about how this work will be done. And I just want to just touch on the Bringing Home report because in the summary and the findings of that report, it was deemed an act of genocide. So the Australian Human Rights Commission led that inquiry. So we already have some evidence there um, about, you know, just some of the atrocities, but, um, you know, what is this process going, how is it going to happen? You know, what, what will be involved? So there's some of the things that we need to yarn to everyone tonight. Um, but, you know, it's important that we have truth telling before we have treaty. It has to inform the treaty process. So we need to spend time with the community doing this work, but very much the community leads this. And that's what I feel is important. Mm. No, thanks, Art. Really strong points around community leading this process. And that's the opportunity in front of us. Um, Pete, did you have anything to add to, um, you know, the the key question, which is um, what is truth telling and why is it important? Well, um, yeah, well, tr truth telling to me, you know, on, on a personal level, and I guess, you know, growing up and seeing, you know, the 
things that have happened to families over the years and, and the stories that I've heard from from these people. And, you know, like Donna mentioned, you know, with, with her mum, the, my, my dad was part of that stolen generation as well. He was taken away at the age of 10, I believe. So, he, you know, he, he'd been with his family all those years and all of a sudden he was he was removed and everything else. And, you know, I remember, remember speaking to dad about the times he had, but, he, you know, he, I guess he was probably fortunate enough he he battled through it and come out the other side and it's um you know in a, in a sense when when I came along and you know and my nieces his nieces and nephews etc and his brothers and sisters and it, we we've continued that journey and it's about coming coming out the other side of that that for all those terrible things that happened but you know the truth telling and what it, what it's about is, is like Donna mentioned, is it's it's going to be a big part of the treaty. It, it has to be, you know, and truths and stories. Everybody's story should be told. There should be nothing that that goes unheard. Now, whether whether you think it, that it, or you know anybody out there think that it's important or it's not important, I, I really assure you that it is, and it, it'll be a part. It's all part of that big puzzle of getting, you know, making rights out of wrongs that, are, that have happened in the past and um, you know and I, I guess I'll probably just really quickly mention that you know my belief with, with this treaty and this, this truth-telling commission part is that, that there needs to be research done so we need to go back further like as Jason was saying back to to them old fellas who you know started all this back in the day and you know the, the, to let non-Aboriginal people that black fellas are here we're here we're not going nowhere and you know, and it's and how he mentioned that these this younger generation now are, are getting on board and they're understanding. So, but it's important again that you know education is a part of that, education and awareness on on how how we're here today and how we're all here today. So yeah, that's that's me. Uh, Thanks, really Marcus. Good, really good points, mate. Yeah, really good points. And we've got some questions coming in, which is great. I'll we'll tackle the first one and then we'll jump into. Uh, in the question two, and um, one of the questions from our audience is, uh, do you see the massacres as, as crimes of war? The truth-telling mechanism will need to consider the legal classification of events and which human rights laws applies, which really leads itself to the comments that Jason said earlier. Um, I might just get everyone who's, um, uh, all our panel members to put hit mute if that's okay. Um, and yeah, massacres have to look, be looked at. That's that's definitely uh, something that needs to be looked at. And I guess that leans, so what we've heard from Pete, we've heard from Donna, uh, we've heard from Jason, um, and Melissa will, uh, will obviously jump in here, is we've heard what it needs to be and what needs to occur. Now, our role is to develop a terms of reference and then it goes off on its own sort of independent nature. So I guess a question that our community are asking is, why is the assembly um, working on truth telling? Melissa, I'll throw to you. You've got a view. You're just on mute, Melissa. Sorry, can you ask? Oh, oh can you ask the question again? Sorry. Yeah, Why sure. is it important? Um, Oh, yeah, key, key question is why is the assembly working on truth telling? I think a lot of our community will be wondering why the assembly is actually working on it. Well, we're working on it with the with the state government to come up with an independent body, which will run its own course once we establish that. And in establishing that, we need to have the input from our community into how we're going to be setting it up. Like, who are the people who are going to be um, selected to be on this process? In, uh, as commissioners and, and um, yeah, I hope I answered that. Don't yeah, know no, thanks, Melissa. Um, Jace, did you have anything to add to that? That why why is the assembly working on on truth telling? Well, it goes back to obviously the resolution had to go through the chamber first to get the government to commit to commit to the um, process. So um, the good news was that the government committed to, I guess. Like I was saying earlier, the resolution in its in its raw sense, um, because we've got to deal with we you know to, to get to the to get to the treaty stuff, we've got to deal with 
we've got to deal with the massacres. We've got to deal with all the impacts of colonisation, the massacres, the protection era, the assimilation era, deaths in custody, our, you know, our prisoners now, our children out of home care now, all, all, of, all of those things. So the truth telling was an important part. Um, I guess that we're working with, we, we've, the first step is for us to do the resolution. Um, first and foremost, independent, independent, independent. And for me, I guess the terms of reference is in the resolution itself and, and the government have you know, established that they're committed to that. So I guess that this is a necessary step to enable the formation of that independent body to go around now and, and, and conduct those inquiries. Because first and foremost, it's about, I guess, solely about human rights abuses. And, and um, rather than looking at about as collecting stories, it's, it's actually about testimonies and the gathering of testimonies. And for me, that is going to be the fundamental um, actions of the inquiry, um, the gathering of testimonies. So really, it's just setting up that independent body to go around and, and to start to do that, to do that, um, to get that done. And like I was saying earlier, it's an opportunity for the government to, you know, we know, we know the history. They know the history from their own reports and commissions. Opportunity now for the government to, to actually stipulate that genocide has been committed. You know, you heard Donna talking about the Bring It Home report, had a fine of genocide. They're, 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 I'm just going to go through um, Article 2 in the um, International Convention on Crimes Against Genocide. So Article 2 says, in the present convention, genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial or religious group as such as A, killing members of a group, B, causing seriously bodily or mental harm to members of the group. C, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. Uh, D, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. C, e, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Now, that would be the finding as a genocide just in the Bring It Home report alone, but Australian government, Victorian government, tick every single one of those boxes, let alone one of them just uh, amounting to, to, to genocide. So we're working on this to, to advance that and to get that. And, and you know what? There's only one Australian history, and that's the correct Australian history and correct Victorian history. So we're working on that to, to ensure that all Victorians and all Australians have an understanding of that correct Australian history. Uh, points really well made, Jason. And just to emphasise what uh, you've just said and what Melissa has just said, um, that we are developing, because the resolution come through our assembly chamber, we are working on a terms of reference that will create an independent mechanism. And that's when significant consultations will occur with our communities to start figuring out what, uh, I guess we'll know what how wide this will go, but that's when we can start um, looking at how this is gonna be set up and how these potential hearings or whatever they look like, similar to what you've said, Jason, will take place. But right now, our role is to establish the, um, the terms of reference. Now we've got questions coming in um, thick and fast from community. So I'll jump across to one more before we get into the next question. What strategies are in place uh, to reach all mobs to have a voice? Good question. And I think that's where we're relying heavily on community to help us do this um you know we need back from on board um to help us through this process and so we've got an engagement team with the assembly uh with assembly members that are supporting members to hold forums workshops in the regions reach out to our orgs um but also a questionnaire through our website obviously we've been hit with something we weren't anticipating and that's an international pandemic which is making things really difficult and you know it's been tough for all our mob, uh, but we've also got uh, the deadly Lisa Thorpe who's working with us leading this engagement as well, who you can reach out uh, through our engagement team and we can, drop the, uh, we can drop Lisa's contact details in the chat. We'll move to um, the next question um, for our panel members. And that is, um, what, will truth tell it, what will the truth telling body be called and and how will it be set up? And I might throw to you, um, you Jace. You've had some really strong views, and and um, you know have a lot of experience in looking across the world of how these have occurred. In my mind, I'd like to see it set up in that you know, do we need to call it a commission? We, we've 
when you look at the impacts, when we got mission in, in the words and we're looking at all the stuff, I guess, with Royal Commissions that's delivered previously, um, still sticking to Truth Inquirer, Truth Commission, it doesn't sort of what's name. But I, I, I really like the idea of the um, United Nations models, United, you know, international best practice. And international best practice says, you know, says to me, um, you know, around in the UN, there's a special rapporteur and a special rapporteur just is a focus on um, indigenous um, issues and indigenous um, human rights. In, in my mind, that's a person who, who is like uh, essentially the message, the message stick carrier, like the person who's the conduit between all, all, all parties. Um, but when you're looking at a UN based model, the expert, you know, while well, the experts for me are first and foremost are the survivors and the victims. The teams of lawyers and all that, you know, on the UN model, they, they work for free. They don't get paid because they, there's no there's no way of doing doing by. So there's a lot of people out there that support us. You know, we are we are just um, you know, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander population in Australia. We have 300, 370 or close to 400 million Indigenous people that stand in solidarity with us. So there's a lot of support and there's a lot of thing, a lot of support and a lot of people out there willing to support and engage with us. So um, the minister spoke about having investigative powers. If we're going to have an, in, an independent body, then maybe could it be established in a way to set up similar to IBAC, where it's funded by the government, but it's an absolutely independent office that with investigative powers. But the language of the staff, I'd like to have the language around, you know, sort of like decolonize the language also, decolonize every single element of it. Um, in my mind, I like the I like the sound of a special rapporteur or the message to carrier um, that works alongside with whether we're going to have commissioners or whatever. But we're going to have a team. There, there will be a team of of, of human rights experts, um, you know, from far, you know, far and far that, that, that would want to support this far and wide. We're we're a country that you know everyone's um, you know. It's not, when you look at other places where there's been truth commissions or, um, um, you know, on, on the ground in war-torn countries when the war is actually really happening and, and, and people are turning up to give their testimonies knowing that they're going to, there's a good chance that they're going to die because they just want to have that truth told and have that testimony told. So the potential for having a really international best practice um, truth-telling process in Australia, in a country where we're not where, where we're not um, being bombed, where we're not, you know, being macheted, um, but we're continually under attack by, I guess, government policy. Um, you know, really, we should be having the absolute platinum grade best international truth telling process of the world scene. There's just, you know, we can learn from from all the models that's been around the around the world, but we should be also teaching the world something. No, thanks, Jace. Um, so, Arnie, do you mind if I add to that, Marcus? Yeah, Pete, jump in, Pete. Please, thanks, brother. <clears throat> I, that Jason obviously knows, you know, he's done a lot of research and he's very, you know, and it's great. I, I love sitting there listening to him, and it's, um, you know, because I'm learning, learning every time the lad speaks. But, but the thing that he mentioned about the, the independent side of this, this commission is, um, is going to be very important. and. Well, I'm, I'm sure there'll be questions from community about exactly how independent this body will be. And, you know, we, we've, been, we've mentioned it earlier, we've mentioned it in the, in the committee meetings as well, that, you know, my, my thoughts about the, the is it, it could be the five to seven independent commissioners that may be doing all the, all the groundwork and the, the legwork in getting out recording stories and et cetera, et cetera. Um, that these people really need to be also independent of of any boards or committees, et cetera, and, and go in completely independent, no baggage and everything else. So they're all concentrated on the job at hand. So yeah, the independence thing is, is going to be really important to this this process. And I think it'll give a lot of, you know, a lot of the Aboriginal community out there confidence that there'll be you know, no stone will be left un overturned or un unturned in this sort in this um, in the research and investigative work that'll be done that, that's it thanks thanks Marcus yeah, no, it's a really good um, really good point uh, Pete and um, I mean yeah 
Jason's obviously got a lot of technical expertise. Um, so I'll throw to Arnie Donna with the question, what will a truth telling body be called and how will it be set up? What will, you know, if we're sitting, we're sitting around with our mob, Arnie Donna, what are we, what are we anticipating? What will this body be called and how will it be set up? You know, what are, what are some of your key considerations? You've been a key leader on our assembly around language and it's important use. So do you have any, any thoughts? Yeah, I'm always calling out and just reminding ourselves as an assembly, we are an Aboriginal organisation, not a government one. So we need to be able to communicate what the work that we do um, to our communities um, in an Aboriginal way, not a government way. Um, that's just a technical side of some of the work that we get on with. But, um, you know, what this body will be, what will, you know, Jason just touched on, um, you know, um, some of the work that he's done in researching all of this and bringing this to the assembly. Um, but also, you know, it's got to be independent. It has to be separate um, from government. That's a really big, um, important factor of having a truth um, telling body or, and who will lead this process and do this work. But um, and it will be independent from the assembly because it, it's it's got to be enabled to be uh, a body that is there um, to address the unfinished business, to um, work with the community on um, doing the, the truth telling work. Um, I like to mention that you know these is about the gathering of testimonies. So I have a when I we talk about this stuff, my protective. Um, I go into protective mode and, you know, I always um, question our work at the assembly around the protections we need to embed in our work. So if you have a truth telling process that's independent from government um, and from the um, assembly itself, but it's very much led design, you know, by the community, um, you know, you want to protect, protect the integrity of the truth telling process particularly because this is for the community. Um, you know, some of those, there's been truth commissions, truth and justice commissions, truth and reconciliation commissions, um, but it will be a body. It will then become an entity, but it will be a place um, that will address the unfinished business, you know. We've been told too long to get over our past. Well, excuse me, everybody out there in Australia, you do not know our past and what our people have been through. And we are often asked to give so much of ourselves to support reconciliation, um, to support um, organisations and developing policies. We need a bit of breathing space. We need to say, hey, hey, everyone, this is what we need to do as a community. And we need to invest some time in getting this right. So whatever this body that the community feels it should be, you know, we need to hear from the community on that. So, um, you know, what will be the steps and the legal processes to, to get it started? Um, yeah. Uh, thanks, um, thanks, Art. And one question that's come in from, um, from the mob out there watching is, um, you know, how about a dedicated uh, Aboriginal community controlled organisation for truth telling? I'll, I'll throw it to you, Aunty Donna, and then give Melissa a reply. Um, I'm just mindful we've yep. got questions coming yep, in yep, yep, fast. Yep. So um, that would be, I think that's exactly one of the things that should inform what we're doing. There, that's it. It, it, it should be. Um, we need to invest in that. We've got little bits of information and it's spread out. This dedicated organisation. Um, you know, we do so much research. We always look at the impact of colonisation. Well, it'd be nice to get the evidence, not nice, but it, um, we need to have that evidence. These are the things that have impacted our people. This is how long this practice was sustained for. This is why we have all of these, um, you know, um, shocking health statistics and social justice issues that we're, we're trying to address through a truth telling process. Can I just say something that might uh, add some clarity? I'll just throw to Melissa, then I'll come back sure. to you, Jason. Yeah, absolutely. Are you just on mute, Melissa? No, I'll let Jace have him. Over to you, Jace. Yeah. So just something for clarity for all those people out in the community also that might be thinking about what it's going to look like. 
I guess first and foremost, one, it will be an independent. It will be an independent body. Um, you know, we've already in the resolution that will have UNDRIP, it will have international best practice, it will have principles based on transitional justice. So it won't be assembly's job or the government's job to go and gather these testimonies and, and do this. It'll be the role of the independent body, working alongside with our communities, and gathering those and gathering those testimonies. So. We're just here to ensure that it goes through as, a, as an independent thing, but I just want to get clarity that it will be an independent body. It won't be assembly. It won't be the government. And that independent body must and will work alongside our communities. And it'll be about victims and survivors and it'll be about the gathering of testimonies first and foremost. Yeah, really, really powerful yeah. points and really good clarification, Jace. Uh, Melissa, did you have anything to add? Yeah, it's about being um, community-led, you know. That's why we're reaching out to the community to, to get their ideas and to get, you know, as well as, you know, their thoughts on how we should be putting this together. And, you know, everyone's everyone counts. No one's left behind. Yeah. yeah. No, really good points. Um, strong points by both Jason and Melissa. And I guess it poses the question, Jace um, and Aunty Donna, Pete, Melissa... We've heard really strongly that this has to be independent and that it will be independent. And that's what we're out to achieve. And, um, you know, we know this is gonna be a community driven out outcome. It needs to have community ownership. So the question on top of it being independent, I might start with you, Pete, is who will run the truth telling process? What's your thoughts? Well, yeah, my thoughts on, on how it'll be run, it'll be, you know, obviously independent of government, pretty much independent of everything. It's an, It'll be Aboriginal run uh, for Aboriginal people, you know, to, to hear Aboriginal stories, truth-telling, et cetera. And um, I guess what I'd really love to say is that, you know, my message to community, to Aboriginal community out there, even, even to some the non-Aboriginal community members who... You know, have, have been a part of Aboriginal communities for mostly part of their lives, etc. But you know, is, is to to work work with us. Um, you know, um, walk with us side by side, and you know, and, and I think we'll, we'll get a we'll get a lot done. It'll be a much much smoother process, and you know, and of course, there's going to be criticism along the way with, with this sort of stuff. But um, you know, we're, we're not going to always get everything wrong, but you know, there are there will be opportunities to to get to take steps back, which was I said earlier that with this truth telling thing is we're going to have to go back and do the research to find out. You know, you talk about intergenerational trauma and everything else, and there's you know the generations of children now who I know, and, and I don't know if people will know me out there in you know the IT land. That, you know, my background uh, is justice. I've worked in justice for a long time. I currently am, and you know, I see a lot of that, that um, I guess that indirect trauma that these kids are still living from things that happened to their, their grandparents and parents 30, 40 years ago. Um, so, you know, in terms of the, the, the criticism, is by all means criti criticise, but, but, but have put some constructiveness to it so that we can work with it, because that's what we want to do. We, we want to work with each other. So, yeah, thanks, Marcus. No, really strong points, Pete. You know, can I jump in there, help us. Marcus? Yeah, Aunt, over to you. Who will run the uh, truth telling process? Well, we spoke about that we need to have people that are recognised in the community who are trusted and highly respected, who know um, who know how to um, support community through this process um, and be able to, you know, do do this work. So. Um, we know it's got to be leaders that are trusted, um, highly skilled, um, have the integrity, but also know um, how to how to do this work. So you know we need the community to think about about what those people who who they would be and um, you know what they can um, do for the community with leading this process. They need to have be approachable, they need to be respected, they need to have integrity, they need to um, be those those people, um, like I said, can do this work. So, you know, we need the community to think about um, 
who they would be, you know. So are they commissioners, special repertoires? I don't know. Um, yeah, that's a brilliant question. I, I might throw to, before I throw to Jace, because um, I know you've got views on this, Jace, but to our um, to our community mob who are, who are tuned in on Facebook Live watching this, who should run a truth-telling process? What are the skills you want to see? What do you want to see in the people who will be running it? Are they commissioners? Are they not? What's the role? Uh, we want to hear from you. Let us know. Case, um, who will run a truth-telling process? Yeah, sure. For, for me, in my mind, that's an easy question. Um, you heard my, my thoughts around what the body, what the, what the face of it could look like in the form of a special rapporteur. But who should be running it? Um, victims and survivors, of course, 100% victims and survivors. So it's about gathering those testimonies and having that independent body work alongside our community, like I stated before. But victims and survivors will be, will be running this. Um, the, what do I see as a role for assembly in this, even though it's an independent body? I see public education as a critical element in this that assembly can do to empower our mob. Let's start empowering our mob through public education as we run cons uh, community consultations. Um, let's have a focus on empowering our people, get, get them a really good understanding of what the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People is. Start giving them good understandings of what international law is, so like what the International Covenant on the Crime Against Genocide. You just heard me point out the four elements of that which amount to a genocide. Let's empower our mob with what is customary international law. And that's where in the international um, for the International Court of Justice or the international, for the international human rights area where Aboriginal law is recognised. So there's opportunity for us to empower our mob as assembly with public education. But in terms of who's running it, um, like I said, I would like the public space to be a special rapporteur or a message to carry. But absolutely, victims and survivors, because this is solely about human rights abuses. Thanks, Jason. And to our mob out there, you know, we want to hear from you. Tell us what you think. Also, don't forget, there's questions on our website, which I put out earlier, and we'll also drop into the chat. We've got a question from um, from the mob who are tuned in, and I might throw it to you, Arnie Donna, and then see Pete and Melissa, if you want to jump in, um, given we've just heard from Jason. But Arnie Donna, so the question we have is, does the Stolen Generation Redress Scheme have a bearing on this? The Stolen Generation Redress Scheme, there, there is one, um, well, it needs to happen because absolutely it has a bearing on this because not everyone's going to be, receive their, their redress or have lived um, to, to um, be redressed for crimes against them, against them. you know, we've how long has this country been locking up our children for um, so brutally and um, so frequently that, you know, um, that it's just normalised in this country that we lock up Aboriginal children just without a thought. We, you know, we want our elders for to, to, to stop that. And absolutely, redress is um, absolutely part of truth-telling um, because victims and survivors have a different... Um, have a, you know, a different experience, a lived experience, um, you know, and we know that there's elders and, and families out there still suffering and hurting um, because of the loss, you know, and we know, you know, you, when you wipe out language, when you steal land and when you um, profit off our loss and, and our people don't flourish and suffer, you know, we need to address that. And um, the fact that our children have been hurt for a, a really long time, absolutely redress has to happen and happen fast because um, it's been a real kick in the guts to some families about what's happened for their family members. You know, we've lost too many elders and our kids are hurting and um, we need um, absolutely have um, redress is, is absolutely a part of this. Thanks for the question. No, that's all right, Art, and just acknowledge your leadership through this as well. Uh, it's been critical, along with a, a lot of our our, um, our people out there who have long marched the streets for this. And so what we do know is that in a truth-telling process, we'd imagine that we're going to hear stories of our stolen generations through that truth-telling process. Um, 
the truth telling process won't be the redress because we know government already already committed to redress back in March, I think it was Arnie Donna. Um, so, but we know that through a truth telling process, we will hear them stories. Um, Pete, oh, you, yeah. can sorry, I just can I just jump in there because thank you because you've just reminded me about the injustices of you know our elders who have suffered at the hands of the state and the atrocities that occurred and we 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 um, you know a lot of kids went to the Ballarat orphanage. I'm talking to, you know this is a personal um, topic for me, but um, our elders have been calling for support for a long time and have really had to. Um, at, on their last dying breath, um, looked for that support, called for that support, rallied um, on the steps of parliament. They didn't get a lot of support. Mm. So, you know, having this truth-telling process for stolen generations and all the families out there um, who've lost ones, their loved ones in um, custody and whose children continue to be taken, um, we don't know what that's like. Every family... Um, as a different experience. And when we think that something's been, you know, it just, it blows me away that the level um, of, of, of hurt and um, what's been inflicted on our people still continues. And we have all of this work. And I just think we need to put all this truth out the front. So everyone who comes to this country knows what, um, has happened so yeah it's really important sometimes I get my words fluffed up but you know um, our families um, have lost so much and this truth-telling process is for them now your messaging is as powerful as always aren't and thanks for sharing um, I'll cross to Pete and to Melissa if you have um, you know any views on you know, does a stolen generation redress scheme have any bearing on the truth-telling process that we're establishing? And then I'll, I've got a question from um from our mob out there on on Facebook Live, and I'll throw that to Jason. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Marcus. So I think Donna pretty much said it all out there, and you know, gave, I mean, her thoughts. I mean, I'd echo her thoughts and and one hundred percent agree. But you know, again, in the justice space. You know, and once the Truth Telling Commission gets gains legs and, and some momentum, we'll we'll actually start hearing truth telling stories from you know as short as last week for me. You know, there, there'll be these fellows who have you know this sort of stuff is still going on. It's probably just still going on in a in a different different way or different legislative way or, or whatever. You know, I, I see it. All, a, a lot so you know again you know i still say you know, there's still research to go back back and back as far as we can but you'll hear stories with, you know especially with this covid pandemic thing that we've all experienced this year there's um there's going to be so many more but uh yeah that's that's pretty much it but yeah well well said don i agreed with everything you said though beautiful thanks marcus thanks pete Melissa, did you have anything? Yeah, to add? yeah, I echo those um, same Donna and Peter. Um, it's just that you know we've got to start addressing the policies and you know that happened. So I think you know um, telling the truth, telling will start addressing those policies and you know hitting them to, um, full on. So yeah, that's all I just wanted to add. It, but uh, yeah, you covered it, Donna. And I just think having this truth-telling process um, puts everyone on notice that um, there's no there's no um, sugarcoat in anything anymore. Um, and this is why things need to happen quickly, like yesterday. And this needs to stop. You know, we don't want to hear another sad story that a family member in Victoria or anywhere in Australia or up in Torres Strait. Can, um, you know, um, is being hurt. So, yeah. Thanks, Art. No, thanks. Um, there's a question that's come in, um, which I'll throw to Jason, and I'm just mindful that um, we're um, we're really chewing. We're, well, we've made good progress on time, but we've had really good questions and really good um, a really good yarn so far. That question is uh, well. One question that came in, Jason, which I'll just clarify, is who would facilitate? 
assembly or independent authority. Uh, mm. The assembly is working with the state until it's formally set up and then it becomes a completely independent authority or mechanism. It's away from government and it's away from us and it'll run itself. The question I have for you, Jace, and it's just come in and uh, you've spoken a little bit about this already is how do we educate our people and what would that look like? Mm. It's that we've always had that big focus on community engagement and we just run mm. public education parallel with community engagement, um, like I touched on earlier. And it's just around informing our mob around what, the, what those human rights abuses are under the, under the international microscope. Because going back to the resolution, which has already been agreed by the government, independent, um, you know, international best practice. So it's about, um, you know, it, it's about just having those, having those facts, those evidential facts and findings. We don't have to reinvent the wheel we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We know uh, about the massacres. You've only got to look at the massacre maps. We know about stolen generation when you look at the, the bring in home port, you know, fantastic report. Um, so that's a matter of what it's going to look like. It's going to be a matter for it. We know what the terms of reference are. So that's going to be a matter for the independent body. And like I said, it goes back to the victims and survivors will be the ones that, that run this um, for the independent body. I know there was mentioned about the redress and how is that going to be affecting with the truth telling. Truth any redress and all that is going to be, that's, that's treaty business and that's up to treaty negotiations. In my mind, the truth telling is just a focus on that human rights abuses and that's it. But having said that, there are non-monetary non reparations that the government can do um, as a good faith. Number one is that we know, we know under the international crimes against genocide that this country has committed genocide so for the government to come out and stipulate that and acknowledge that yes we have committed genocide would be a good faith measure that they can that they could do as, as a statement to come out with um why when i have to reinvent the will and go back and run trials to, to have that that's already known the second thing is that you know there's a big big focus on our on our um on our prisoners so let's go back and look at that what can the government can do there let's go looking at our unsentenced prisoners uh, particularly our unsentenced single mothers that are sitting there in in the cells. There's also yeah, good good stuff. Good. There's also good stuff around. Where the government actually have a lot of good policy, you know, in, that's that's designed to support Aboriginal people. We'll go back and if there's any, we talk about, you know, we always talk. Every time we talk about closing the gap, everyone always defines it as um, external Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander disadvantages. You know what the government actually has a lot of good policies there aimed at that should be supporting our kids and our families you want to talk about closing the gap as a non-monetary um reparation go and close the gap between that policy and the practice and we might start seeing better outcomes for our children and our families also so these are you know some of the some of the things that can be done um now but in terms of uh what it looks like i guess that uh, going you know, beyond on after we finish and hand it over and it goes to the independent body. I think I've sort of like, um, yeah, I sort of think I've been sort of pretty clear on that, like what my thoughts and perceptions are and when we're going to put it to international best practice. Because I'm going to reiterate one thing I said earlier. Um, there's a lot, a lot, lot for us to learn and, and gain from, you know, in the international best practice field, but there's an opportunity for us to teach the world a lot and, and advance on that, you know, um, best practice let's have the world's best um truth telling process let's teach the world something and let's not forget uh, that that our our people have waited for their justice for 23 years and they never did anything and that needs to be sitting at the forefront of the work that we do too because that's quite personal you know there's a report there there's evidence there 23 years later nothing's been done you know so we yeah. We need a process that calls that out as well, yeah. and and not everyone agrees with um, what's happening. So we need to make sure we listen to everybody. So I just feel passionate about that, but I'm aware we're nearly out of time. Yeah, aren't we? we've just got to um, the end of our time. So, um, but points well made, and and Jason as well. And you know, for our mob out there watching, please join me in thanking uh, our deadly panelists in. Um, Jason Kelly, Annie Donna Wright, Peter Hood, and Melissa Jones. Um, you know, what we're asking is, you know, we need you to help us shape this. Um, this is a community-driven outcome. As we saw with Jason's resolution, it was a member-led resolution. 
seeking a community driven outcome. This will become independent very soon and there'll be further consultations. And we want the best. We want it to be internationally, you know, for international best practice, as Jason has said. And I just want to finish on one comment from, um, from our mob out there who are tuned in and listen, listening. And it goes to the fact that, um, you know, uh, Pete had mentioned earlier, I think all panelists have mentioned actually, but the admission of facts. Can we get a statement of agreed facts by all parties to start with and put in a joint press statement prior to January 26 as an indication of good faith by a state, uh, by the state, sorry, and to undertake an extensive education program run alongside the Truth Commission, if it is a commission, in fact. What are elders' roles in this process? They're critical too. Oversight by them in recognition of their place of decision making in or in and around mm. our law, I think is critical. And I think that's a really powerful statement and something that is um, really strongly echoed throughout our amongst our members and in turn amongst our community. So I just really wanted to finish Yeah, what's to celebrate? Yep, yep, yeah. no, well said, huh? But um, again, join me in thanking our, uh, our deadly panelists and thanks for tuning in. Um, we hope it's been helpful. Don't forget to jump on our website, www.firstpeoplesvic.org. Check out our questionnaire. We want your input. Um, have the conversations with your family, have the conversations um, you know, with your community and you know, help us design an international best practice model that we'll hold the government to account on because no longer can we tell one side of history. We need to tell the real and the true side of history and we won't be visible in this state or country anymore. So that's the opportunity we have in front of us and it's because of the deadly work all our community are doing and the deadly work of each of our uh, panel members here. So thanks everyone. Um, and unless there's any closing comments from our from our panelists, we'll, uh, we'll close off there. I just got one comment. Um, there's something I said to the minister, like, what's the end game here? So I'm gonna put in a cultural context. We all know about like, um, the eagle and the crow, right? They've been fighting since day one. Under our laws, like we have laws strictly pertain to the way we have our marriages and we have whatever. I'm gonna just talk, tell us, stick to the eagle and the crow in a way. It's like, we're the eagle and they're, they're the crow. Like, but you know, under our totems, the same, one totem can't marry the same totem. You've got to marry your equal opposite. Because if you don't marry your equal opposite, you'll never have an understanding of the universe. This is a way of giving all Victorians a better understanding of the universe by telling, having the truth telling and in a cultural context way, bringing the eagle and crow together. Yeah, but, but, Thanks, but them fellas aren't black fellas, that's all. No, so, they're not black, <clears throat> yeah, but it's, it's just yeah, the analogy saying, of, Jace, no worries. it's the analogy yeah. of the two equal opposites coming together. Oh. Hey, can, I, can I just say something really quickly? Hey. Yeah, can I just say something? Um, out, then, we go, well, then we're going off live. But really quickly, to, to create awareness, now we spoke about education a fair bit, need, need education. You're not going to have cultural awareness, etc., without education. Very important. And this is, this is going to be part of this, this truth-telling process. So thanks, Marcus. Thank you. Spot thanks, on, everyone. Thank you. thanks, everyone, for Thanks, joining everyone, us. for tuning in. Thank you. See you later. See you, Donna. Bye, bye, Dom. <laughs>